The legislature delays passage of the 2022 appropriation bill. Gender equality bill suffers in the Senate. House of Reps contemplates giving autonomy to Nigerian customs. 2016-2017, most projects were not cash backed. And later on the program, I'll speak to Sergius Ogun, House of Rep member and representing Asian Northeast and Asian Southeast Federal Constituency in the National Assembly. This is the Hallow Chambers. I am Tijesu Adiri. Let's start by telling you that the House of Representatives is taking serious the insinuation that some police officers may be involved in sabotaging security efforts to crush all threats and stop all attacks carried out by armed bandits roaming the vast forest areas in Nigeria's northwest and north central region. The lawmakers have set up a committee to probe the police and verify claims that security agencies refuse to persecute and punish bandits arrested by the local security network in the area. That on the 11th of December 2021, several of, uh, of these bandits attacked Pinau, a village in Waseloho government area of Plateau State, killing several persons, cutting away their uh, uh, goods and food items. I can understand that I can walk into a police station to complain as an ordinary member. But the presiding officer of the house followed up an investigation and some people were caught and under his watch they were released, not one, not twice. You can imagine some culprits are caught, they are released and these things are on record. A, a video goes viral, whether it is false or true. We need to intervene. I sympathize. I sympathize with the Nigerian police, the army, and all the security organizations. But it is very, very unfortunate and, and it's sad that our people no longer have confidence in the security apparatus in this country. Hopes for the passage of the Gender Equality Bill were deemed at the Senate plenary despite frantic efforts by Senator Biodun Olujimi to explain the benefits and significance of the bill. Those who oppose the bill say some parts of the proposed piece of legislation may contradict the beliefs and custom of some section of the country. But the President of the Senate has given the bill a lifeline and has asked Senator Olujimi to review her bill and represent it for second reading. This bill seeks to further implement Section 42 of the Constitution of the Federal Republic of Nigeria, 1999, and other matters connected therewith. It also seeks to provide certain provisions on the Convention for the Elimination of All Forms of Discrimination Against Women, CEDAW, and the Protocol to the African Charter and Human and People's Rights on the rights of women in Africa and other matters connected therewith. I believe if we dialogue rightly, we will get to where we are going. And I believe that this is the time and day that this bill will see the light of the day. And it started with the sponsor of this bill saying that she's changing the topic, uh, the, 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 the title of the bill, to be gender equity. And to me, that is where I've always wanted to support, that we have to be accountable. The sponsor of the bill has obliged to amend, and that, uh, that she has submitted, and is recorded, that instead of saying gender and equal opportunities bill, she has amended it to read gender equity bill. I think when it comes back, by its grace, this particular bill will be subjected to public scrutiny. I will not support the passage of this unless until the word equal is removed. If we now have debate on the gender opportunities bill, fine. But when you bring equality into it, it infringes into the practice of Islamic religion. The National Assembly pushed further the day the Appropriation Committee will lay the 2022 spending plan on the floor of the Hallow Chambers for a clause-by-clause -clause consideration and passage. 
The delay in the budget passage is caused by the inability of the committee to capture INEX requirements for the conduct of the 2023 general election and also the cost of next year's proposed headcount by the National Populations Commission. We had a very robust and frank uh, interaction with the uh, with INEC and National Population Commission. It's in respect of uh, the complaints we've had from different quarters about the inefficiency of funds that have been uh, provided for them in the 2022 uh, appropriation bill. And uh, because of the stance of uh, the Senate of the Federal Republic of Nigeria, that uh, these two institutions need to be properly catered for in terms of their funding. We all know the importance of uh, election in this country. And indeed, the entire world, it is the foundation of every, every democracy. To tell you that uh, whether it's going to be passed this week or not, but we are still working on it, you can make your calculations. All right? But I don't have the authority. The Senate President will be the one to tell you so. The bill seeking to repeal the act establishing the Nigerian Customs Service and grant autonomy to the prime revenue generating agency did not get the support of the organized private sector and the Minister of Finance, Budget and National Planning, Zainab Ahmed. The stakeholders are rather more concerned about the overlapping functions of regulatory agencies. But Speaker Femi Bajabi Amila says the act guiding the operation of the Nigerian Customs needs an overhaul for more efficient service delivery. To address existing challenges with customs enforcement, post efficiency, smuggling prevention, efficient collection and remittance of government revenue, and the proper implementation of government fiscal measures. We are at the precipice of transforming Nigeria Customs Service to being the most potent revenue collecting body in Africa and to making it the most efficient streamlined, technologically driven, and people-friendly agency of the Nigerian. The contemplation of an autonomous postal service is in abeyance with extant laws regarding the Treasury, supervision of the Treasury, and all agencies which remit funds to the Federation account and the Consolidated Revenue Fund. We are still studying the document. Yes. We will take a short break. When we return, a House of Representatives member representing SN Northeast and SN Southeast Federal Constituency of Edo State will join us on the program. Stay with us. We'll be right back. Thank you for joining us, Honorable Member. Thank you for having me. We kick off this interview session with the politics of your state, Edo State. Your party, the PDP, is still relishing its gains of the governor. Everything is good. We have a brand new governor. And that's not only for election in 2023, but that at least he will be finishing his second term in 2024. And that gives a good atmosphere for him to work with the existing structure to produce the next set of leaders in the state. So Edo State is good. You are a ranking member of the parliament. How well has this impacted on you as a person and all your constituents? Uh, well, the house has been okay. We, I mean, now some of us are ranking members. We, we have the experience. And um, we have also been able to take projects to our constituency, say for the paucity of, um, of funds. There are so many things we hope that we would have been able to accomplish by now that we have not been able to accomplish because basically there's you don't have enough money in the country. But so far so good. So far so good. I mean these uh, remember in the I think it was 2017, 2016, 2017, most projects were not cash backed. You know, although we are borrowing a whole lot of money now as a country, but some projects have been funded. And uh, there's adding value to the lives of people in our constituencies. So so far, so good. As a key player in the Ninth House, how would you say it has fared from the point of view of an opposition party member? Well, I don't know if there's anything to pinpoint, but 
I, also, I think I want to thank the leadership, the speaker, the leadership, with the way the pro project budgets have been executed. The January to December is a huge plus. Then the fact that projects are, always, are also being funded. So like I mentioned earlier, in the last, okay, two, three years before now, the, the, our ZIP, the Zona Intervention, I usually funded about 70%. Some agencies will tell you about 50%. But in the last two years, it's been 100%. That's, that's, that's a good one. Because this, these, are the proje these are the projects from the federal that will take to our constituencies. And as I will keep saying, without these projects, our constituents will not even feel the presence of the federal government. So if you have those projects in the budget and they are not funded 100%, that leads to either abandonment of projects or not having enough presence. So that's a good one. Maybe that's the takeaway from the collaboration between the National Assembly and the executive, you know, which I think the leadership today should be commended for. So the National Assembly is not a rubber stamp after all. That's what most people will say, but that's not the topic of uh, discussion today. There's a part of it that's rubber stamp, and there's a part of it that's beneficial to members. Would you want to take us into that? Uh, well, the good part is what I have told you. The relationship has led to full funding of our projects, our zonal intervention. The rubber pond, uh, stamp aspect of it, uh, even though I don't agree 100% is rubber stamp, but you know people want grit, people want to see friction and fighting between the legislative arm and the executive. And at times when there is uh, that romance or coziness between both arms, truly the, the, the electorate should be worried because as if they have thrown them under the bus and they are they're in a romance. But when there is a fight, most of those fights are healthy for our democracy. It will mean that everybody will maintain you know, their own line of responsibility. But when there is a romance, the legislative arm can close their eyes to all manner of things that the, executives, uh, the executive is doing, and then they get away with all manner of things. But so far, so good. But I just think we need to monitor the executive some more. Because the budget, they write the budget. They execute the budget. You know, and if you don't follow it up, the people will suffer. And yet, these are the people we are supposed to give voice to. These are the people we are supposed to represent. You know, so that is why I think we need to fight some more for the good of our people. What is your assessment of the Buhari administration thus far? I, I think the president, I would want to say the president has done well in the sense that I think he's... Uh, He's been firm. I think he's been firm when he has to do with certain things. I regret to say that he didn't start like this in 2015. You know, but I think he's also realized that he will be exiting the scene in a short while. And he needs to do things, you know, he needs to leave a legacy. You know. So I think he's a bit firm and I believe God that he would finish strong. First and foremost by assenting to the Electoral Act in good time, just like what he did with the Petroleum Industry Act, you know. He assented to the Petroleum Industry Act and then immediately sent it back for amendment. I hope he will also do that with the Electoral Act, assent no, to it. Direct or indirect primaries, on what side of the divide do you belong? What passed the first, the second reading on the floor of the House? was both direct and indirect. What went to the Committee for Consideration was direct and indirect. What was debated, what was before the public hearing, where you, have, where you had INEC stakeholders and the National Assembly members, was direct and indirect. And what was recommended for close-by-close -close consideration in the Committee of the Whole was direct and indirect it was on the day of the consideration in a rowdy session that the speaker of the house moved for amendment for it to be direct 
because the the focus that it was on electronic transmission so people were not listening some people just were deliberately rowdy and that's how it went through so having said that i think the part that was properly considered through all the stages was the direct and indirect is it true that the governors are against direct primaries because it will whittle down their influence i don't think so the governors are very powerful the governors are very powerful there's no governor that will not have a hand in the emergence of their state uh, party chairman. Most times, some will overreach and be involved, even the, in, the, in the selection of the LGA or the election of the LGA chairman and then ward chairman. You know? So if the governor controls all the structures, these are the people that will organize the direct primaries. If they control the structures, you can't take it from them. And the other part of the direct primaries that I really don't agree with, when you hear people say, uh, you are taking out the money bags, even you do in direct, when you do direct primaries, I don't believe it. Example is Lagos, that a sitting governor was defeated. Was it really the people? It's the same godfather we are talking about. Anambra, a serving, gov a serving minister in this administration, was in the field with his people waiting for the direct primaries to happen. It never happened, and the result was announced. So I am here to see the advantage. But like I said, let's deepen our democracy. Direct, indirect, should be left for the parties to make. We should allow the parties to make that decision. But to say direct primary, primaries will cure any ills, I don't believe that. I strongly don't believe that, even though I do not mind it. Because I believe if you do direct primaries every day, I will win. But it's not about me. It's not about us. It's about today and the future. Yet to be confirmed report says Mr. President has once again declined to assent to the latest round of amendment to the Electoral Act Bill. What is the implication of another rejection with the general elections drawing closer? Well, I, like I said, I think the president should sign. If he has serious issues, sign like he did with the PIA, sign and then send the amendment. He did that just some months ago. So he can also do that right now. And if he has reservations, maybe he can also send it to the National Assembly. Actually, there's a romance right now between National Assembly and the, the villa. So he can latch onto that relationship to say, look, this is what my, this, these are my thoughts. Can you look at it and revisit it? If he doesn't want to do that, assent to it and then send it back with some recommend, the recommendations you want for amendment. And I'm sure the, the, the House will look into it or the National Assembly will look into it. What is your take on Nigeria's security situation and what for you is the way out for Nigeria? I think the, the government of the day, I think they came in, they politicized poly, the security. And it's on record that one of the seven governors is a video that's trending that look, I think he said that far back in 2014, that why should they not politicize security? If you are angry that they are, we are politicizing it, improve it so that we don't have anything to talk about. But today, the government's in power, they are getting away with murder, so to speak. Because even the PDP are not, are not, are not politicizing security. We are not even speaking enough about security. Your party, the PDP, has obviously not given the ruling party a run for its money in terms of providing needed opposition. We, have, we haven't done well. We haven't done well at all because, like they say, kings don't protest. You know? PDP, we are, we are kingly. We don't, we don't, we are... If you remember before the president came in, he was involved in a protest in Abuja here. You know? So tomorrow, we don't expect our presidential candidate to go and be protesting on the street. Just tell Nigerians what you can do for them. And it's so easy to take their minds back to where they were. Now it's Christmas. This is end of year now. Most of us are having a headache on how we are going to buy rice. How much was a bag of rice? You can't even remember. You should remember. In 2014, when we were contesting election, we remember how much we bought a bag of rice. But today... We are struggling to send a trailer load of rice to our constituents. You know? 
And so there, there's no basis for comparison at all. But I'm happy. Nigerians are aware now. It's one thing to use propaganda to win election. It's another thing to come into power and then, you know, prove everything you have said. So it's very, there's, there's no more lies. No more lies to say or tell. After 16 years, you think Nigerians will welcome PDP again? Okay, compare the 16 years of PDP to the 8 years of APC. It's like day and night. It's true. Yes, if you ask people, where were you in, where were you in, I mean, was your life better in 2015, before May 2015, compare the life you lived from 1999 under PDP to the life you've lived now from May 2015 to maybe 2023. Nigerians would prefer to go back. If I might just give you some data. When the PDP came in, in 1999, the price of crude oil was less than $10 a barrel. Our foreign reserve was less than $9 million. So, yes, $9 million when PDP came in. I think it was about $3 million. But by the time PDP left, how much was it? It was about $31 million, billion. $31 billion, sorry. You know? And why was this so? Because the, the issues we had all over the world, you know, PDP set up Ancon. On that PDP, that was the set up Ancon to bail out the banks and all that. If we didn't have strong foreign reserve, we would not have been able to do that. You know, so that is why the global problems we had with banking and all that did not affect us in Nigeria. That was a cushion. So for APC to come and start talking about what they have done, what they have not done, they have, they are, they have not even started. So there is no basis to compare both parties at all, I'm sorry to say. No basis at all. What is your contribution to the fuel subsidy removal debate and the effect on the people? I don't think it will get there. I just think, I think this government is just, if you remember again, there's a video that's been trending when the president said that there was no subsidy. Now who's subsidizing who? But I think he's known better now. But you see, the thing about putting out things when you're not in government is just to let... To, to abuse people's minds. They succeeded. The APC succeeded in doing that. Throughout all manner of lies. And Nigerians bought into that. They have won. They won the election. They are in government now. Now, they have told Nigerians there is subsidy. Compared to when they were campaigning, they said there was no subsidy. Nobody was subsidizing anybody. So, when they remove it, some of us are in support of the removal of subsidy. Because everything we are earning from the sales of oil, we are using it to bring product in. Who does that? And we are even subsidizing the 40 templates that the government is using to import petroleum products. And who are those importing? Only NNPC is importing. NNPC is government assistance today. So when they remove it, we will truly know what we are consuming. They should allow private sector, private hands to bring in products. And to the glory of God, I'm sure Dangote will start producing by then. So I don't think it's going to get to that 300 and something they are saying. It will not get there. They should allow everyone that can bring in petroleum products to bring in. All you need to do as a government is regulate. Make sure the standard, there's a standard required that we use in Nigeria. Make sure that whatever they are bringing in meets that standard. That's all. We'll round up this interview with your bill seeking to empower organizations, both public and private, to provide crutches for nursing mothers for the purpose of exclusive breastfeeding for six months. You must be a he for she. That, that bill is, is, being, is being in the works. The assistance today, the Labor Act allows for four months maternity leave. And the, the whole world, World Health Organization, UNICEF, have said that from one hour after giving birth to a child, that child should be on exclusive breastfeeding and for minimum six months. But if the labor law allows for four months maternity leave, there's a gap of two months. So what we are saying, if you have crashes in in workplace, whether public or private establishments, the women can breastfeed their children. So after your four months maternity leave and you resume work, you can resume with your child. You know that your child is just some minutes away from your office. So you can walk and then go check on the child and breastfeed that child and then go back to your office. And it's something I believe that everybody will be happy that, uh, to see uh, happen. 
That's where we end this week's conversation on the hallowed chambers. You can watch the program on TVC News YouTube channel. Do not forget to subscribe, like, and share. Also, follow me on social media. I am Tijesu Adoui. Thank you for watching. See you next time.